Hey, what's going on, everybody? Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with American country singer songwriter Tyler Reese Tritt. In this newest episode, Tyler talks about her newest set of singles, Texas Hold'em, Porch Light, the first time she ever performed on stage, what life growing up with dad was like, how music has meant everything to her, and more. And now, with that being said, hope you enjoy my conversation with Tyler. Tyler, hello. Welcome to the show. Hello. hello. Thank you so much for having me. I mean... We've we've got to talk right off the bat about um you've got a new single out. Two. Two new two, singles. Two singles out. Um so let's let's talk all about them right off the bat. I want to talk about first off, um, you have a single out called Texas Hold'em. Um and I was like, is that correlating to the game, like the poker game? It, um, I, because, yeah, it was like a... I was I was kind of caught off guard with that. I was like, I don't know which one she was referring to. If yeah, it, no, it was like a, like a play song. on words. Yeah, they definitely um they did it to imply it was like the card game, but it's not. <laughs> I mean, can you talk to me about sort of the the idea or the premise behind uh, behind that single and what you want people to take out of it? Yeah, I mean, it's just you know everyone goes through heartbreak. Everyone goes through you know their your breakups and um obviously everyone handles them differently but texas hold'em is just you know it's that specific relationship where it's like you know that you're not good for each other you you know you may still love each other there there may still be love there but you know you're just your oil and water you're you know fire and ice and you're just complete opposite so you're basically it's saying in the song like texas hold'em Cause you know, if I see his face, I know I'll turn around. Uh, you still love that person, but you just know it's best for everybody to just not be with that person anymore. So I fit. I felt that that was very like a lot of people could relate to that. For sure, and um, I, I want to refer to the lyrics that you sort of written in that song. You said Texas hold him and keep him under your sky because I'm leaving and I'm needing all the help I can get tonight. If he follows, won't you slow him down? Because if I see his face, I know I'll turn around. Don't you let him go till I get to where I'm going. Texas hold him. Mm-hmm. And it seems like when I'm like reading those lyrics, it, it really seems like that song sort of was like a self-reflection song of saying, well, I guess like when you're going through phases of of, of heartache and you go through phases of, of, of breakups, mm-hmm. like you were saying, but you're also, I guess, in the song, reflecting to, to yourself where you're saying, well, if I go through those moments in my life, does that ultimately lead to where I want to be heading? Um, and where do I want to see myself in five years time? Like that's, that's what I get out of the song because it's sort of this whole, like, well, it's also about like reminiscing on the past, but not really reminiscing fully. It's sort of this, this whole, like, I, I, I don't really know how to like put the play on the words, but like, it's sort of this this thing where you're sort of un- understanding the past that you've had, but then again, right. you're going through the moments where you're saying, "Well, actually, I'm in the moment where I am thinking ahead as well uh, to what I want to be doing in my in my life." Um, what what goes into writing songs like that, if you don't mind me asking? Well, I actually both singles. I did not write those. Um, my friend Jada Dreyer, she's a very prominent songwriter in Nashville. She writes a ton of amazing, just amazing, just hit after hit. And she actually hit me up and was like, I have a bunch of songs that I'd love for you to listen to. And I listened to them. And out of all of them, Texas Hold'em and Porch Light stood out to me the most. And mainly Texas Hold'em because I was going through something very similar in that time of my life and it was like I had wrote the song myself so it really really resonated with me and I figured that it would resonate with other people too that's why I picked it yeah and uh, also uh, we have to talk about porch light um porch light is also the the second single Mm -hmm. that you released sort of in, in in this year and um you've also accomplished porch light because it gained traction the music video of it airing on the country network and streaming on the cmt's website what does that mean to you to, to be able to, I guess now, like realize that you've, you've achieved that. And and that's a big accomplishment in itself to be streaming on the main yeah. country music television website. That was amazing. When um, I remember when Christy from my PR team had told me that that was going to be playing on 
CMT, I was just like, oh my God, what? Like, you know, I, we did, we did the music video. I had a blast making it. Um, but I never, you know, I never thought it was going to make it to CMT. I just figured we put it on YouTube and, you know, everyone would see it through social media. But when they said that CMT was going to play it, it was really just like a, I couldn't believe it. I was so, I was very, very excited. Uh, of, of course. And, and, um, I also want to ask, I guess, in terms of um, your musical influences, because I know you you sort of talked a lot about it in in a lot of articles that I've I've written I've I've, I've read of of you, and you sort of touched on sort of the Linda Ronstadt, the Miranda Lamberts, and the Martina McBride uh, uh, realm of the world. Um, what sort of was specifically that? from those artists that you sort of picked up the influences from, like were there specific moments and performances from them that you sort of that stuck out to you and that resonated with you, I guess. Yeah, it was, uh, it was just their different styles. Um, you know, Linda Ronstadt, she can sing everything from rock to country to opera. And I really loved her range, um, how she could just do it all. And then, you know, Martina McBride, Trisha Yearwood, Faith Hill, Reba, you name it. Um, I just, you know, I kind of just sampled a little bit from everything, anything that I listened to that really just that I loved that they did. I was just like, all right, how can I take this, their sound and, you know, obviously show the influence that I've had, but make it my own sound. And that's been really fun to try to figure out how to do. And if you don't mind me asking as well, how how did your dad sort of accept this whole reality of of you going into music? Because at, at, because <laughs> reading about you, it it really seemed like he wasn't really on board with it at first because he was saying that, you know, like you're you you got to be tough in this business. And yeah, he was know, not. He, he was not with it. But then you sort of were really convincing and you really convinced him that you know this is what you wanted to do you want to pursue music and then he sort of was like telling you that i'll be here whatever advice that you need but you got to figure it out on your own um, yes right i mean how much of your dad sort of played into i guess the whole music career aspect of it i guess well, a lot of it for sure, because he was definitely the reason that I even wanted to do it at all. Um, you know, growing up, being around, watching his shows, I was like, oh my God, like, this is amazing. You get to go up there every single night and do what you love for a living. And I already had loved to sing, but, you know, I was like, you know, I'm going to be a vet or, you know, I'm going to be whatever. And then I was like, and that was, you know, younger but I kind of always knew I was like, you know what? Singing is, it's my, I love to sing. I always have, I love everything about country music, the stories that they tell, you know, um, the emotion you can hear in their voice, just everything about it. And yeah, when I had first gone to my dad telling him that that's what I wanted to do, he tried every which way to just push me in the opposite direction. And I was not. He, once he realized that I wasn't going to pick anything else, then he was like, all right, I'll, I'll help you as much as you need. And, you know, wherever you're, wherever you need help. But yeah, he was like, you need to do, do this on your own, which I really respect. For sure. And um, I, I, I guess, I guess talking about uh, as, as we're talking about your, your, your father and sort of the, the role that he played in, in your career. I also want, like, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what was sort of life growing up with with your dad because um you know the world knows you know the the world knows about obviously your father and and your father being travis tritt himself um uh, the legendary music artist that, that he is um but a lot of people don't know the behind the scenes and 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 the life i guess growing up around him could you talk to me a little bit about that because i'm, I'm curious oh yeah no uh he's he's a great dad um He's not, I guess, how a lot of people would think he would be. He's um, he's a lot like my older brother or my, more so my older brothers or my older brother. I say my older brother. He's my middle brother, but my I have two younger brothers. So he's my older little brother. And um, him and my dad are so similar in personalities. You know, they just they love to have fun. They're big goofballs, always cracking a joke. Um, 
you know, my dad's a very loving, caring, charismatic, funny person. And yeah, to me, he was just dad. So, you know, I didn't really get the whole star thing or like legend thing. You know, I was like, he's just dad. So yeah, no, uh, I got really, really lucky because he, he, um, he figured out early on in his career, like the balance of like family life and home life. So even though I didn't really get to see him a lot, he definitely made up for it in other ways. And there was a, there was a, there's a very good balance there that he was able to figure out. Certainly. And, and I also want to refer this back to um, a, a documentary series I was, I was watching. Um, it was, it was called, uh, I think it was, it was the Stallone family, the Sil- Sylvester Stallone family. And um, they, they sort of had this documentary of, of their family and sort of were sort of like correlating all like the different episodes um, in terms of how their life was with growing up with a guy that was so famous um, because it's Sylvester Stallone, obviously, and he's, he's world renowned. And, you know, I was so like invested in terms of like, what was life like with growing up with a guy like that? But to also know, yeah. to hear, to hear your story about sort of the life growing up with, with your, with your dad and, and he wasn't really Travis Tritt in your mind because he was more yeah. of just like a father, you know, yeah. he was more of a father to you. And I had the wonderful opportunity to speak with Ashley Campbell, who had um, her, her father was also Glenn Campbell. Yeah. And I was talking to her about what was life growing up with her dad? Uh, was he what was he Glenn Campbell to you or what was he like and she sort of referred to it it was just a simply great childhood you know he sort of was the protector among all of us oh, no. he always wanted to play with us when when we were little he wanted to just play games have fun oh that was jokes, dad yeah crack jokes and and it seems like what you're just saying now that it's almost like what your dad is like um I mean were there specific moments in terms of your life with with your father that sort of stuck out the most that still resonate with you today or is is there one specific moment that comes up I mean we all we've there's so many moments we always had fun being out on the road but I think my favorite memories would be when I knew like he was coming home and when he'd get home he would spend all of his time you know like playing with us taking us outside we were riding four-wheelers we were, you know, shooting guns. Um, but my favorite was that some nights he'd let us stay up a little later and um, we'd watch like cartoons, watch the Simpsons. He was really big into like Looney Tunes and stuff. So um, we would all just sit around and cuddle up on the couch and watch cartoons together. And that's like, those are some really, really great memories that I that I always have with dad. I'm also, I'm also curious as, as, as you were just mentioning, like, I guess watching like television shows and and enjoying that moment of of your life as well. But is there sort of like one TV show that you're binge watching right now that you can share with the listeners? I go back and forth um, on a lot of them, and I'm horrible because I'll if to watch a new show you got to like fry my teeth open. Like I really, if I find a good show, I'll just rewatch it over and over again. But I just started watching, which is new for me, um, Scandal. It's an older show, but I'm obsessed right now. I cannot stop watching it. So, yeah. Would, would you, I guess, like correlating this back to to the music realm of things, um, because it, it seems like you're really into those old style stuff. Um, do, you, do you remember sort of the the first set of records that you that you purchased because i i mean there's, oh. there's got to be vinyl records that you purchased during during your life and, and it wasn't today. even country the first record that i ever got it was actually um hillary duff and a lot of like the girls my age will know what i was talking Damn, about that's because, random yeah it was so random. and i would listen to my my brother knows it because he makes fun of me all the time he was like he even remembers because i would play it over and over again I had my little like it wasn't a Walkman but it was like the portable disc you know portable CD player and I'd always have my headphones on and I'd listen to um Come Clean from that album and yeah that was the first I think I wore that CD out (laughs) Uh, but yeah that was the first record that I I ever bought 
Wait, in 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 terms of the that portable CD thing, was that the thing that where you sort of were just had to run with? Um, because I I remember I was watching the Bobby Bone show and I was sort of I was watching this uh, Christmas episode that that they were releasing on on their YouTube channel, um, and then one of them were gifted sort of this this Walkman and it was sort of this disc and and you sort of listened to it while you ran, um, and like in while you're like jogging I guess. And you sort of had this earphones in and you sort of would, would listen to it on a, on a portable CD thing. This um, wasn't so much like that because if I tried, you had to hold this one. Like it was, it was the circle, like, you know, could fit a CD, a CD. But if I moved it the wrong way, it caused the song to either skip or not play. So um, I really just had to like walk kind of careful with it. Um yeah, I, w- I tried running with it several times and walking with it. It didn't work out for me. So I would just, you know, you didn't have iPods or anything at the time. So that was as close as I could get to listening to my favorite song on repeat without annoying everybody else around me. So, Other than the Hillary, Hillary Duff record, what else records do you have that, that, that you can share? Oh, gosh. Hillary Duff. Um dad would give us a lot of his albums, you know, he'd bring them home and he'd sign them each for us, you know, he'd leave like a sweet note. Um, I think I had a Jessica Simpson album. Actually, no, I know I had a Jessica Simpson album. Um, oh gosh. I'd have to go digging through. It's been a long time since I looked at all my old, old CDs that I have. Well, I I mean, as we're talking about records here, I have I have a whole stash of records with me. Um, I've I've my own record player. Um, I've um I've I don't know I've I've collected a whole like slew of genres of of records. I, I mean, that. but but I love a a lot of it was sort of like the old soul type of music that you would listen mm-hmm. to. Like yeah. I would I would go down the line. Like I recently purchased Guy Lombardo's records, uh, who um was the I guess I guess the first like person who released the um the New Year's Eve song that you would hear every year on Dick Clark's Rock and Eve with Ryan Seacrest when the when the clock strikes midnight mm-hmm. and people uh yell out Happy New Year, the first song that comes on is Guy Lombardo's version of Old Lang Syne. And that's the song that people know him by every single year. Um oh. and and that I I recently purchased his record but I didn't purchase the one where it had Old Lang Syne on it, which I was hoping to get. But I, I, I found just like a, a different style of his record and just listening to his instrumental parts of his music. I was like, whoa, that's so like interesting how music sounded back then compared to what it is now. Um, I have like a whole slew of Merle Haggard, um, uh, Vince Gill. Um, okay. I have also Patsy Cline's uh, Sweet Dreams record. Oh yeah, you got the good stuff. Kenny Rogers. Um uh what else do I have? I have Elvis. Um oh, yeah. Elvis Diana Ross records. Oh yeah. Um you got so, good uh, records. Yeah. So uh, I mean I mean I try I try to look for really good records in terms of like what my preference is, but when I'm like really looking, you really have to dig. Like that's what mm-hmm. I'm saying about final record shopping. You got to really dig because people put it at the back and you don't see it. Yeah. So you have to really carefully flip through everything and make sure you're not skipping out on anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, aside from talking about records, I want to get to your songwriting because it's it sort of was like at, at first you didn't think that you were a songwriter first. Um, can you sort of clarify that sort of that part of your life? Because I'm I'm, I'm very curious. Yeah, I had just started writing, you know, when I was younger, I'd get an idea or, um, you know, something would pop in my head. I'd sit there, I'd, I'd write with it, I'd mess with it. And then, you know, I guess I didn't realize until talking to other songwriters later on that that was a normal thing. But I'd sit there and I'd be like, oh, I hate that. That was terrible. That was awful. And so I was just like, dang, you know, I guess it came so easy to my dad and so easy to everybody else. I was like, I must not, you know, I must not have had that talent, but then, you know, other artists and I heard Ed Sheeran say something not too long ago too, which looking back now, that's exactly what was happening. It's like a a faucet outside or like a, you know, 
the old hose that the all the cruds got to come out first before the clean water starts flowing. And that's I think that's what I was doing. I was getting out all the stuff, you know, trying to figure out what my riding style was, you know, what I liked, what I didn't like. And then um, I got put in a co-write. I think it was my first co-write. And just and that was very helpful for me being around other songwriters and just seeing how they operate and how they do things, I was able to be like, okay. And talking with them too. I was like, all right, I'm not, I am a songwriter. I just, you know, didn't give myself enough chance or opportunity. And I'm such a perfectionist too. I'm thinking that it should have been perfect, like right off the bat, or I should have come up with a hit, you know, like it was nothing, but it was like, no, it's a learning experience, just like everything else. I'm the same way. Like I am, I am the exact same way because like every time when I'm creating something for my, um, for my podcast and stuff like that, when I'm working on like posters for promotions of the artists that I'm having on the show, mm-hmm. um, I always like to like, really like look at all what the professionals are doing. Yes. And I'm like looking at it. I'm like, that's, I have to do something similar to that because if they're getting content and they're getting listeners and they're getting like fame, like people on their podcasts and, and, and on their mm-hmm. shows, I have to do something similar and I've yeah. always gravitated towards that. But then when you sort of step back and realize and say, well, you can't do what they're doing because they're a corporation. They, you know, they're, they're a whole business and they have a whole business aspect of how they do it. But when you sort of, um, when you sort of like realize, like you're just up and coming, you're just getting used to this whole thing, like starting off with like something that's like at least average, at least average. And that looks sort of compelling um because obviously you want to grab in the listeners and you want people to because i guess i referred back to like cooking because when 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 you're plating something at a restaurant and you're s- sort of sitting it down in front of the customers what are the customers going to what are the customers going to look for first mm. because they don't eat with their they don't eat with their mouth first they eat with their eyes first they see what what they're being handed in front of them that's right, because yeah. it, it, that's that's exactly what the truth is, and that's the same thing that I'm trying to deal with even today. That I'm like, do I do I do something similar to that? Where I'm like, do I go with that thought of like saying, here's something that I'm working on, mm-hmm. but like, how are they going to receive it? Because if yeah. I'm just putting out what I like, which I guess like that's also another concept that you can have, but how are people going to receive it? Yes, because it's something that I sort of loved at the first place. Um, were you always sort of a perfectionist growing up? Because I'm I'm curious. I definitely was, um, and then more so. I mean, it only got worse <laughs> the older that I got. Um, and you know, my dad was always very, even though we are his children, he does not hold back if something doesn't sound good, doesn't look good. You know, he's very, very honest, which I very much appreciate. Um, And because of that, I, you know, I'd make sure myself and he's such a perfectionist. So I, you know, I spent a lot of my life, you know, looking at what he's doing. I think I had no choice like myself to just, I want everything to just be perfect. And I have, it's been, difficult to realize that not everything can be perfect but you just you know you do the best you can and yeah so it seems like music has meant everything to you is that accurate very accurate i mean what about music sort of makes you i I guess makes you excited to get up and 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 go to work every day and and do music as a full-time career now Oh, everything about it. I love performing is definitely my favorite. I love being out on stage and interacting with the audience, but just everything about the music, just, you know, being able to write something from my heart or my perspective and then, you know, putting it out there and everybody else resonating with it or being able to relate like that, that means a lot to me. And yeah, I I love everything about country music, honestly. I guess as we're as we're as we're sitting here and 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 we're chatting, like I guess like when it comes to like moments in your career when you're sort of I guess having 
having some time to to perform with your dad on on stages is there sort of one one like single moment where you sort of realize like an emotional uh, moment i guess with with your with your dad on stage i do and um i get pretty emotional like when i sing anyway like if i really start thinking about you know what i'm singing if it is if it does call for like that certain emotion so sometimes i gotta like get my head somewhere else or pull back. Otherwise I'm a cry baby. I will start crying. Um, so there is some times where I am standing on stage with dad and, you know, we're just having a moment or, you know, we're having such a good time that I just look over at him and I'm like, we're really doing this. Like we're really up here together singing this song. And I don't know, it's, it's very difficult to describe that kind of feeling. Cause it doesn't get old. Like me and dad definitely don't get to sing as often as we used to together, but the few chances that we do, it is, it's definitely, it's something that can't be described because it's, sure. it's like it's a different kind of family bonding. For sure. And, and um, I actually want to read something here because this is, uh, this is like, it's 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 a coincidence that we're talking about this because I had um I was I was looking for some for some quotes and stuff like that that I was I was reading about you and I guess this sort of connects the whole thing as a full circle moment now as as we're talking about emotional moments. I guess it said, I'm so excited and I come off stage and dad's crying, all the band members are crying, and I'm like, Hey guys, did I mess up that bad? And they're like, No, we've just seen you since you were just little and now you're all grown and playing. And it seems like that reading that it seems like you've realized like that was the first time you actually realized how much of an impact your music can make on people. Um, and, and that seeing, was the first time the I'd growth. ever been on stage too. Like that was the first time I'd ever sang with dad on stage and his band. And so, yeah, that, that whole moment was very surreal for me too. Yeah. I, and, and I guess, how did it feel your, your first time on stage? Was it nerve wracking? I was, was, so was it nervous. emotional? <laughs> I was so nervous. I could not stop. I remember I, I was holding the mic. The mic was like shaking in my hand. My legs were shaking and dad just like reached over and he just touched me. And he was like, Hey, like, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. And I was like, you know what? You're right. It is going to be okay. It is going to be all right. And it was, and he goes, it'll get easier after that. He goes, this was just your first time. And my first time wasn't, you know, it was at a festival. So it was in front of a buttload of people. So I, if I, really wasn't nervous I really was once I saw the audience but he was exactly right you know every time after that it just got easier and easier and more fun and now there's you know there's nowhere else I'd rather be I love being up on that stage and just doing my thing <laughs> I mean same same here with with me because you know I, I I love performing as well and um because I remember the the first time when I performed I was on I was uh doing an, an assignment for a music class that I had for for middle school and um the the assignment was you had to pick out of a box at random without looking and in that box are papers of different uh, random genres and you had to come up with a performance of a song from that genre um mm -hmm. and let me just say first and foremost I had no clue what music was when I was doing that that first time around Right. I, I, I picked at random. I picked country for some reason. For some reason, I picked country and I had no idea what I was doing. Um, <laughs> so then you go you go home, you sort of look at you look on YouTube, you start searching up country songs. Um, and long behold, the song I chose that was perfect for my voice was Country Roads by John Denver. Oh, um, that's a good and, one. And the first time I performed that in front of in front of the class, everyone was like, whoa who is this kid you know like 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 awesome. yeah and and when you get that reception you're like I, what? I have no <laughs> idea of what I was doing there um and then the music teacher comes in the next day and says how would you like to perform at our spring concert because we would love to have you and 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 uh, perform that song in front of the parents and and, and kids and stuff like that I'm like for sure <laughs> and I step up on that stage and I'm like nervous as hell. I bet. Like, like, I'm like I'm like nervous as hell. I'm like, oh, what am I doing here? Like, 
that was just for an assignment and people loved it. So I'm like, whatever. Yeah. But as soon as the music comes on, I guess it's just an instinct. It's just an instinct of a performer where you're just like, you know what? This is where I'm meant to be. You know, yeah. this is this is where I'm meant to be. Um, and then sort of in high school, I did like four years straight of like their the school talent show, and oh. ev- ev- even in the fourth, like my last year performing there and my last time performing on that high school stage, I like, I I kid you not that I got like my legs were shaking backstage, <laughs> and once they called my name, and and I guess that's the thing with being being uh, being performer, right? When you hear your name. Mm-hmm. Um, being called out and you get to step on the stage and you perform just music in general it doesn't really have to be a career but if you just love performing you hear that, your name and you're like yeah. oh god exactly <laughs> oh god exactly um and so like i i enjoyed like performing ever since then and um while still doing this well, podcast, and you, were, you, know? I, you had a good reason because performing in front of peers to me that is 10 times more nerve-wracking than performing for just like a random audience people that you don't know that you may never see again you know you don't really know anybody me personally when I know there's someone in the audience that I know I am way more nervous I'm like oh god here we go (laughs) so you performing at the talent show in front of all your peers I would yeah I was in the chapel band at my school and I remember I'd go out on tour with my dad it was like nothing meanwhile go up on stage for chapel band and I'm like oh my god they're all staring at me I have class with all these people like it was completely nerve-wracking for sure and you know like it's it it's just it's just a whole like I I don't know how it is I like it's it's sort of this adrenaline rush where you're sort of like you're 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 thrust into a moment where you're like all right this is it you're about to go on stage and, and perform in front of these people yeah. don't mess it up like in your yes. head you're saying don't mess it up That's you know? exactly- <laughs> like you're like don't mess it up it's 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 gonna be bad if you mess it up um and yep. um I, I i guess you know performing i guess is is a whole like i guess cathartic thing as well where you're sort of just in the spotlight but what i like to like when i when i tell people who are going on stage for the first time and and like people performing the talent show um mm-hmm. i always like to tell them you know like i've done this for a number of years trust mm-hmm. me like just pretend like nobody is there yes just pretend like you're just in your room singing as you would and and just pretend like there's like an, an empty crowd like oh, yeah. like chairs are empty nobody's there it's just you rehearsing like that's exactly what i tell people and i'm, I'm like as soon as you think about that you start being more comfortable in your own in your own skin you start being comfortable in your own sort of performing abilities um then you start to forget about there's a crowd in front of you but you're also like presenting this song where you're like this means a whole lot to me you know it's oh, not absolutely. about like it, you know i'm not looking for a career in this i'm just here because i like performing um absolutely. and like ever since then like i i started like releasing like i, I guess like covers of of songs and i guess like my most recent cover i i released was vince guild's whenever you come around um oh. And Vince Gill has been one of my idols uh, growing up, and and I've loved his uh, I've loved his music and and the character he is, um, mm-hmm. because he, I guess, listened to one of his interviews. He said he was asked, "Do you crave the spotlight?" And he says, "I enjoy the spotlight, but I it, it's not meant for me. I, I, you know, I enjoy being in it, but I'm I'm not the one to crave it. You know, mm. I'm, I'm not the one to to want it every time." You right. know, like I'm, I'm, I'm just a guy who likes country music and playing the guitar and 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 being around my family and and just doing it with like friends and stuff like that. You know, it's, you know, he's had like hits and albums and he's like, hell, he's that has and, and 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 I remember his uh, CMT Giants speech and something that cracked me up was he was like, people were saying and 25 million records sold and he's like, hell, that hasn't even changed in in, in how many years um and uh so i guess that that just goes full circle when we're we're talking about sort of music in general and it sort of looks like you know music has meant everything to you and has meant everything to to your family and um if you could like now if if you're like looking back on on your younger self and, and you're saying um 
I, I guess if you if you look back to your younger self, what would you say to what would you say to her? Oh gosh, I never really thought about that. I would say whatever you are feeling, whatever you're thinking that you want to do for the rest of your life, don't let anyone tell you you can't. And there will be times where you may think, you know, things will get hard you may think for you, but keep pushing. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. I keep pushing. And eventually, um, eventually it'll all work out and everything's happening the way that it's supposed to. For sure. And, um, I guess that cat really want the photo bomb. Here. <laughs> um, uh, that's going to be an iconic moment. I'm just going to say that. Um, well, I guess we've we've reached the end of our time together. But thank you so much for speaking with me. I, I had such a such a blast to be able to explore everything that we did, and uh, um, I'm 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 glad that we got we got to talk about um, uh, the life with 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 your with your dad and and just getting to know who he is as as a father and and not. I guess a, a performer aspect of it. Um, but thank you again. Of course. Thank you so much. Thank you again for having me. To those who made it this far, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with American country singer songwriter Tyler Reese Tritt. To reach Tyler, you can connect with her through her socials and you can visit com for more information about her music. If you enjoy this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, feel free to share with others, post about it on social media or leave a rating or review to catch all the latest from me. You can follow the show on all social media platforms. I've been your host, Shikmi Kelsang. Thanks for tuning into the show. Mm -hmm.